Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be home. It felt good to walk into the sanctuary this morning, but it was a bittersweet walking in as I was reminded how much I miss seeing each of you. It it gives me a little bit of an insight to what God must feel as for 6,000 years He's missed being face to face with His children. The longing of God's heart to no longer have to quarantine our planet, but to finally be able to come home, bring us home to be with Him. We're getting just a little taste of that as we're here, quarantined away from each other, practicing, worshiping from a distance. I want to go home. How about you? I want to go home. And I believe that we're going to go home soon. I, I saw on the Facebook Live feed, that's right, we are on both YouTube Live and on Facebook Live, I saw that we have someone watching from Thailand. I want to send special greetings to you. I know we have people watching from other parts of the world between Facebook and YouTube. We want you to know that though you may not be right here in Michigan, wherever you're watching, you're right now a part of our family. Welcome to the Lansing Seventh-day Adventist Church Family Worship Service. I want to do quick two brief introductions before we pray and move into our, our sermon for today. The first is, on LansingAventist.org, our website, you'll find a PDF that I've put together. And every week I'm going to be releasing a new PDF. What's the PDF? It is a reading, daily reading summary to prepare you and your family for the sermon that's coming every Sabbath. We're going to start going through a book that I have learn to really appreciate, um, called Great Controversy. It's a, it's a book that looks through church history and then comes down specifically look at the prophecies that deal with the end of time and what's happening right before Jesus comes. And family, Christ is coming soon. We see the signs around us, and I think it is vital that we understand what's coming. And so what I want to encourage you to do, you'll notice this week is we're going to be coming out of chapter 30. The sermon is going to be out of the Word. It should always come from the Word. Someone should say amen in there in your home. But secondly, um, during the week, you'll have a scripture and then a couple of paragraphs on that scripture to study together. And we're going to read a chapter a week. I'm putting together the PDF. I had one last week, and I know a number of you downloaded it. I want to encourage you. The second one is already up. As soon as the sermon is done, don't do it during the sermon. As soon as the sermon's finished, go and look it up, download the PDF, and you can start tomorrow, either for morning or evening worship, going through the readings as a family. And I believe you'll notice what Lindsay and I noticed this last week. We read it every single day in our personal worship time. We did it for our evening worship, so we have something else we're doing for the morning. We saw God bless in a special way during that worship. I want to encourage you, go lansingadventist.org, download the PDF, and join us all as we read together. The second thing is, we had a powerful prayer meeting this last Wednesday night. We had about 20, I think it was about 20 people that joined us. It might have been a little bit more than that. And we are studying through the kingdom of heaven parables. Again, focusing on getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. We want to go home, and we want to be ready. So I want to encourage you, this next week we're going to be looking at the second Kingdom of Heaven parable found in the book of Matthew at 6.30 Wednesday evening. Again, go to lansingadventist.org and you can see how to join us over um, the internet and become a part of our, our service. Well, as we begin, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us. I feel that especially this morning as the topic we're looking at couldn't be more important Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence, preparing to study your word. We don't want to hear human words and human ideas. We want your divine realities to not just be comprehended, but to change our lives. We want to be new people in Jesus. And so we ask, no matter where we may be watching from, pour out your Spirit upon us. Fill our homes. 
Father, there may be someone watching from a hospital room. Fill their hospital room. They may be watching from somewhere else, wherever they are, Father, fill it with your Holy Spirit and your angels. I pray that you'll speak through me. You'll hide me behind the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And in a moment, I'm going to ask that the AV guys in the back will throw up a picture of our brand new baby girl. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. When uh, you're turning there, you can just hold your finger there. I want to share with you what it was like that first time that Chloe took her first breath. I, um, I now understand what parents mean when you've told me you don't understand love until you have a child. I was so thankful when she was there. She took her first, that first inspiration of breath. And she began to let out that cry as she was getting the oxygen flowing through her system. It was, it was incredible to watch. And as that, that, that thought of love and just incredible joy went, came over me, and I was so thankful for all of that. And, and then, then a little bit later, she, she had her breath, and then they got, brought the bottle, and I began to feed her for the first time, and she began to take her first bit of milk. And, and I noticed that I didn't need to tell her how to breathe. I didn't need to tell her how to suck on the, the, the nipple of the bottle to get the, the milk inside. I didn't need to tell her how to swallow. I, I didn't need to tell her how to do a lot of things. It was really amazing. As I watched my child begin to take her first breath in these different things, she automatically began to respond naturally to what she needed to do to be able to stay alive. You know, it was interesting to me that, that as she took that first breath, the nurses didn't have to sit down and say, okay, now, Chloe, I need to explain to you what you do here. You, you, you expand your diaphragm, you tighten your diaphragm down, and that's going to pull oxygen into your lungs, and then you're going you're gonna to blow it back out. She had never taken a breath before, but no one needed to tell her what to do to take that breath. It was interesting. We didn't have to sit down and draw out a diagram of, of, of how you bring milk into your mouth and then how do, you, how do you move the muscles in the back of your throat to be able to swallow. No, she did it all naturally. It was incredible. She naturally knew what to do. And you know, as I, as I watched that, I, 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 and then was thinking about the sermon today, it, it was interesting to me. She always knew what to do. It was a part of her nature. It was natural to her. You know, we all have things that we naturally do. If you were to shine a bright light into someone's eye, you're going to notice that their pupil shrinks down quickly. If you put them in a dark room, their pupils are going to automatically expand. That's not something that we consciously do. It's part of the autonomic responses of our body. Our pupils automatically dilate larger and smaller. It's not something we learn to do. It just happens naturally. There are other things. If you put your hand onto a hot stove you're, and, and, it's, and it's hot, you're going to pull your hand back quickly. Not because you t it was an automatic response because it's something that's become a part of what your nature does. You naturally do it. And as we come into Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, I want you to notice that when God originally created us on our way into Genesis 3.15, we naturally did what was right. It was as automatic as the breathing of baby Chloe as she was taking her first breath. It was as automatic as your pupils changing size based off the light. It was just a part of who we were. It didn't take anything special. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, as God, as man came forth from the hand of the Creator, God put him there in the Garden of Eden, and everything around him was not only perfect and beautiful, was never in danger of doing wrong because it was naturally a part of who he was. But then something changed. As we come to Genesis chapter 3, you know the story well. You've read it many times. We've heard many sermons on it. In Genesis chapter 3, as we come into that part of the sermon or the story, we notice that something changes. Man partakes of the fruit that God said, don't eat. And man's nature fundamentally shifted. 
You see, before that happened, man naturally did what was right. Man naturally, whatever that was good, that's what man did. And man naturally resisted doing that which was evil. But as you come out of Genesis chapter 3, those first parts, man goes from doing what is natural and pretty good, uh, not just pretty, good, to now naturally doing what is evil. In fact, if you'll remember from the reading this last week, it, it, it's very interesting that, that Satan's goal in getting man to disobey God was to add to his army and rebellion against God a people who would live their lives completely in rebellion against the king of the universe. That was his goal. And if God had left us where we were, we would have completely walked away from what God was calling us to do. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. If you're there, you can say an amen right in your home. I may not hear it. You can always text me an amen. I got a bunch of texts last week that was just awesome. Not last week, three weeks ago, the last time I preached. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God gives a blessing to step in and protect mankind. Notice what it says. Christ here speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put, what's that next word there? Enmity. What is enmity? Enmity is, is, is hatred. It is, it is a dislike a, and don't want to be around. God promises to put enmity between what? Notice what the Bible continues on. Between you, who's the you here? He's talking about Satan. Between you and the woman. Between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Praise God he didn't leave us alone. God promised to put a separation between us and Satan. You see, our nature naturally wants to do in our sinful nature. Naturally wants to rebel against God. You know this. I know this. I've um, I found that I oftentimes have, in the middle of trying to do right, messed it up really bad because it's so easy to start down the wrong road because it comes so naturally to me. The first point of our sermon is after the fall, sin came as natural as breathing to my baby girl. It comes naturally, and I'm saying sin comes as naturally to me as breathing did when a baby's first born. Strange, growing up, my parents didn't need to teach me how to disobey them. They had to teach me how to obey them. You know that as parents. Growing up, I, I, I didn't need to learn from my parents how to argue and fight with my siblings. I naturally, needed, I naturally knew how to do that. They, need, they had to teach me how not to fight and how not to argue. It was natural for me to do the wrong. My parents had to teach me to do the right. And your parents had to do the same thing growing up. They were always trying to correct you and move you in a different direction. In fact, if you take your Bibles and go with me to Romans chapter 7 and verse 17, Paul brings out this point of how easy and natural it is for us to do the wrong. It was not something unique to myself or to you. It's something that the great apostle Paul struggled with in Romans chapter 7. He, he, he has the whole section there. If you have time, you can read it, chapter th verse 13, all the way down through the end of chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 13. And he carries this whole argument down of, of what's going on in this battle that goes on in the mind. This battle between good and evil that every one of us are facing. This, this battle, of this pull of the lower nature trying to take control of the higher nature. Romans chapter 7 and... Let's drop down to verse 21. You can read the rest of the verses later on your own. But I want you to notice what Paul says. Ah, i got to start up in verse 17. I apologize. Romans chapter 7 and verse 17. Notice what it says. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing... What's that next word there, church? You can say it in your home. Nothing what... Good dwells. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin 
that dwells in me. You see, Paul's talking about this battle that's going on between what we naturally want to do, which is evil, and what we know we should do, which is right. You know, I, I was reading an article this last week, and personally, I, I think every one of us have faced this. That across the United States, but let me just apply it to myself, being quarantined in one's house can become very challenging and difficult. In fact, they were saying that on average, Americans are consuming eight hours of media per day now under quarantine. Uh, the, the streaming services have seen a huge influx of people watching. Which, just as a side note, is going to mean that there's going to be a huge increase because of the close connection between media watching and depression. There's going to be an increase of depression. It's not just going to be the media, but people are feeling confined. There are things that come naturally to us that we may have found this last week and find in our homes we are really struggling with because the natural heart is not wanting to do what God has called us to do. How do we change? Family, how do we become a new person in Jesus Christ? What is the way that God transforms us and recreates us? That's the promise of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It's a promise that Christ is going to work a divine miracle of grace to transform a person who naturally does evil to naturally do well. His promise is, I will put enmity, i.e. hatred, between you and sin. That's the promise of God. How does He do it? In the last couple of minutes that we have together, I want to take some time to look at how God changes you and I. And we begin in John chapter 3. Actually, before we go to John chapter 3, I want you to go with me to Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. You know, one of the greatest dangers that we have is thinking that somehow we change our nature. You know, I've talked to individuals, they, they say, well, I'll just be more disciplined. You know, I, I didn't have enough devotions this week, so I need to discipline myself to make sure I, I'm at home the whole time, but I'm still procrastinating on my devotions or my time in family worship or these other things. I'm, I'm pushing off what I need to do. If I just will get more discipline, I know I can do it better. But church discipline doesn't save anybody. Don't get me wrong. Discipline's important, but discipline doesn't save you. You see, until your nature is changed, you'll never be a new person. There's an illustration I heard this last week by, um, by an old pastor that I greatly respect. And he said this, Disciplining the outside to conform is like a wolf trying to become a sheep. Imagine that you're a shepherd and there's a wolf on the outside and he's, and he's looking in and he's seeing these sheep and he's like, wow, they have such a nice life. They are always able to go from place to place. They don't have to, to do all these different things that I have to do as a wolf. I think I want to become a sheep. And so the wolf comes into the fold and, and he tries eating grass like a sheep. And well, that doesn't taste nearly as good as the rabbit that he had the other day for meal. And so that, that's not going very well. And and then he notices that the sheep, you know, when he tries to, bah, like a sheep, all that comes out is like a howl or a bark, and that scares everyone around him. And no matter what that wolf does, he will never become a sheep, no matter how hard he tries to discipline himself. And that's the same thing for you and I. We will never become Christians through self-discipline. What we need is divine heart change that recreates the character of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah chapter 13. Notice what the prophet Jeremiah says, or actually the Lord says through the prophet Jeremiah. Can the Ethiopian change his spot? Their skin, I'm sorry, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. No matter how much you scrub a leopard, you're never going to get those spots off unless you completely shave it down. Even if you did, the spots are still there in the skin, and as soon as the hair is allowed to grow, those spots will come back. The only way we can change 
is through a divine miracle of grace. A leopard, the only way a leopard will change, the only way someone's skin color can change, is a divine miracle of grace. And that's the only way you and I can change our hearts. A divine miracle of grace is the only way we can become a new person. What does that look like? If you go with me to John chapter 3, verse 16 is what we're very familiar with, but I want to look at the Gospel of John, the third chapter, through a slightly different lens this morning than you may have looked at it before. John chapter 3. You see, that enmity that we need to have put within us, that divine miracle of grace that God, we need God to do in our lives, there's only one way it happens. I can't force it. I can't discipline myself to it, and neither can you. You've probably tried, and it hasn't worked. I know I haven't. It didn't work. I can't work some way around it. The only way that miracle of heart transformation, that nature change, so that I will naturally begin to do what God wants me to do, the only way that happens is when I have a heart change through the new birth. Notice here, John chapter 3, verse 7. Christ is meeting with Nicodemus. It's at the middle, it's at night. Nicodemus is a little nervous that anyone will see him. So he sits down and they begin to discourse and Christ skips past all of the introductory stuff that normally would happen in a conversation because Christ cares about the heart and he drops right to the heart of the matter. He cuts right to its core. This is what matters. And here in John chapter 3 and verse 7, he says this, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Church, don't miss this. The only way we have a heart change is by being born again through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what you faced this last week. I don't know what difficulties you've gone through. I, I don't know what, what facade you've been wearing to your family, your friends, your co-workers or your church. But Jesus doesn't want a facade. He wants the heart. And he wants to change your life. You see here, this natural change comes when we are born again through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the process, as Paul talks about, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, of becoming a new creature in Christ Jesus. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to see this here, this, this appeal from the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, what's it say there? New creation. Keep on reading with me. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As Christ looks down upon us, as we give our lives to Jesus, it's so simple, it's not that hard. You just get down on your knees and you say, Jesus, I confess my sins. I repent of them. I ask you to forgive me. That, that's just clearing the way for the miracle. Those in themselves don't save us either, but it's clearing the way. And then we say, Jesus, please plant within me a new nature and a new heart. And as we do that, the divine voice of the Son of God comes down. And we may not hear it, but the miracle takes place just as surely. And Jesus speaks new life and new hope into your life. And you become a new creature in Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away. The Bible says all things have become what? New. Your nature is now a new nature. Now, now someone may say, Pastor, how often do I need to do this? Church, we got to do it every single day. But every day we get down on our knees and we say, Jesus, 
Make me a new creature in You. Recreate me into a new man and a new woman that reflects who You are. And as we do that, we become new people in Jesus Christ. And our nature becomes new. You see, if you're struggling with an area of your life that you've kept falling into again and again, what you need is a new heart change that Christ will give you to recreate you into a new person. John picks this up in John chapter 1 and verse 13. Go with me, if you would, to John chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 13. Notice what he says. It is not I that determines that I'm born again, it's God. But the promise is He'll do it. John chapter 1 and verse 13, notice what he says. Let's start in verse 12 and come down to verse 13. He starts in verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. That's the new birth experience. To those who believed in His name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but whose will is it that we're reborn? Who is it that recreates us? Who is it that gives us a new flesh? The Bible tells us right of the air, but of God. It's Him that does it. In church, as we realize this incredible reality, this new birth experience that we can have in Jesus Christ, there is a freedom that we can have. We must submit to God. Because He alone can put within you and I a hatred for sin. Here's a quote I came across this last week from a wonderful book called Desire of Ages. Page 173, paragraph 1. Desire of Ages, page 173, paragraph 1. I want you to notice what the Bible says. Well, the wind itself is invisible, it produces effects that are seen and felt. So the work of the Spirit upon the soul will reveal itself in every act of Him who has to save its saving power. When the Spirit of the God th takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love is Humility and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. Now notice this. No one sees the hand that lifts the burdens, or beholds the light descend from the court above. The blessing comes when by faith, the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new being in the image of God. That's what it is. The eye of God reaches down and creates a new being in His image. I want that. Friend, there's no word that can describe the peace of God that can flood over your heart. The peace that you've longed for, Jesus will fill you with as you put your life into His hands. And so we come to the appeal. Have you tried through your own strength to gain the victory? I know I have. Have you gotten frustrated because you naturally keep doing that which is evil? Go with me to Romans chapter 8. We're going to go one verse back to the last verse of 9 and then move in to Romans chapter 8. And this is my appeal to each one of us. Notice what the Apostle Paul says here in verse 25. Remember, he's been talking about that battle between the natural flesh and the new flesh that God wants to give us. And, and how the only way that we are able to be changed, verse 25, verse 24 of Romans chapter 7, and then we'll come into chapter 8 and verse 1. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Notice what Apostle Paul says. O wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ 
our Lord. Now come with me to chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are where? In Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. Church, in Christ, you can be a new creature, a new creation, a new heart. What nature do you have right now? What was your week like? Take a moment with me and just think back on this last week. How did things go? How was your battle against sin this last week? What happened? Maybe you look back and you see a week that you wish you could forget. Maybe there were times that you lost your temper, you got angry, you used words that you wished you hadn't have used. Maybe there were times that you indulged in what you shouldn't have indulged in. Maybe you are discouraged on this Sabbath morning. But today, God wants to speak hope into your heart. And He wants to promise that His promise to you is that if you will turn to Him, He will in no wise cast you out. And He will speak a new heart into your heart, give you new nature, new feelings. Why don't you right now, there in your living room, there in the hospital room, there wherever you are around this world right now, why don't you stop and bow your head? Make the way for Him to work by asking Him to forgive you for your sins and then pray this simple prayer, Dear Jesus, please, and plant within my heart a new nature. Why don't you do that right now, and then I'm going to pray for you. Father in heaven, you've heard the heart cries. You've heard the prayers. I know you've heard and are answering every person's appeal. You long to. You want to do this for every person across this globe. I'm thankful for the individual on the other side of this screen. They've heard your appeal, and right now they've asked for a new heart. Thank you that you promise and that you will give them that new heart in Jesus. Thank you that you are recreating Right now, new feelings and new desires. Father, tomorrow morning when they get up, may they make this afresh. And if they fall this week, remind them that you're the God that lifts back up. May this week be one they find transformed by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Time now for our closing hymn. Please stand with us and sing number 608, Faith is the Victory.
Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all so much for joining us on the live stream. I apologize. We have 214 still to sing. Is that correct? Okay. Please join with me as we have our benediction and prayer. Heavenly Father, bless every man, woman, boy, and girl that is listening right now, who's watching from wherever they are, from whatever place and state they may be. Fill our homes with your Holy Spirit. Prepare our hearts for your soon coming. And may we be able to, at the end of this week, look back and say, praise God, we know our Redeemer lives and we have been walking with Him. I lay each one into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. Thank you so much for joining us this morning to worship and fellowship together. I hope that this study is one that will be a reality for each one of us, allowing Jesus to change our lives and to put the new nature. This is just the first in a series we're going to be going through. I want to encourage you, go to the website, download your PDF. Follow the worship plan with your family. Make it a part of your study that all together we might be doing this. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday at prayer meeting at 6.30 and next week here at 10.50 for the Lansing Church live stream. God bless each one of you.